Wow, thank you for coming. It's great to be here with you. You know, you can call a meeting, you never know if anybody's going to come. It's wonderful. And the energy's great. Um, all right, so first of all, then I'm going to give you a little information that you might have picked up at these earlier events. Um, Dan Sheehan and I are going to facilitate this meeting today. We won't always be the people up here talking. It's not about us. This is about coming together to do something in a coalition, in a community effort for our community, our county, and our future children and grandchildren. Um, Danny and I are from the Romero Institute, which is a nonprofit law and policy center here in, in Santa Cruz. But we're the former directors of the Christic Institute, which was very active here in Santa Cruz in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, when we had a thousand action teams all over the country. Um, and our history, uh, I'll let him, of course, talk about his history, which is very long and complicated and amazing. <laughs> what I would say about mine is that I have a history of working originally in the National Organization for Women. Uh, I worked in community access television productions here in Santa Cruz in the early 70s, which was really the precedent that led to the big center downtown, or because we were doing news three nights a week. And, um, and I also worked in the labor movement, for now, as a national labor coordinator for them. And then in that position, became the director of the Karen Silkwood Fund and the Karen Silkwood Project, which is nuclear. And we, when we won that, eventually, it eventually became a trial that was first a congressional investigation and hearings. When we won that, uh, it stopped them from ordering or building any new plants for 30 years. And after that, we found it Christic, and all the 30 people or so that were working on Silkwood got together and said, okay, we're going to form a nonprofit and continue working on cases and investigations and public education programs and organizing programs that will expose very serious injustice and illegalities by corporate and government officials, and will also work on policy solutions and structural solutions to these problems. So it's real change and not, and not uh, band-aids. That was always the goal. It's still the goal at the Romero Institute. And the, um, I wanted to say that the, this, some of you may recognize this as the Christic Institute symbol, but what it stands for, it, it is now the Romero symbol, what it stands for is the flame of hope, the omega of resistance, the circle of unity, and peace with justice. So that is where we're coming from in asking you to come together and join with us to do a mission. I would call it a soul mission, a sacred mission. Because we're talking about protecting Constitution and our constitutional rights, not only for us, but for future generations, and they are under serious threat, which Danny will talk more about, who is he's a constitutional attorney, very well known, has done many, many cases, and, uh, and, you know, we need to address this, because this is happening on our watch, while we're alive, and our Constitution is something, it's like, as Danny says, it's a, a, a huge, grand experiment in the history of humanity. And we cannot let it erode or be taken away on our watch. It's our job, collectively, to make sure it doesn't happen. It wasn't perfect. It didn't include everyone in the beginning. It gets better as years go on. More people are included. The idea is for it to get stronger, not weaker. And it's a gift that we offer to other countries. No one else has ever had exactly this. It came from here, it came from the United States. So it's under threat, and what we want to do is form a coalition to then form a constitutional protection zone in our city and our county, because the fact of the matter is that the national government right now is not responsive. We have a, they passed the law, the National Defense Authorization Law Act, and it is what is the big threat right now to our Constitution and our rights. And they're not in a mood. Uh, they're not responsive to changing it. Uh, so we're going to have to do it from the ground up. 
And if we start in Santa Cruz and then we spread from there, and, and the reason we're videotaping this is because we're going to keep all of our materials, you know, everything that we can just pan to another city and say, this is what we did. Please, if it helps you, run with it. We believe that if we work positively, there's hope. <clears throat> that people make hope happen. People make choices that create injustice. People make choices that create justice. People make choices that create war. People make choices that create peace. It's really up to us. I'm not saying there isn't another dimension. I happen to be a very spiritual person. But on this plane of existence, we've got to decide what we're going to do, what we're going to think, what we're going to say. And if we do that, we contribute in the field to the very things we want to see happen. So we're inviting you before the end of today to make a decision. Are you in? Because this is the beginning of a journey that we're going to make together. And I believe it will be a deeply satisfying one because I do believe this is something that we know in our hearts we need to do. Thank you, Mom. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know it's a gorgeous day, Saturday afternoon, we'll have a weekend. Uh, lots of other things that you could be doing right now. What we're here to talk about today began, in effect, uh, with the events of uh, September uh, of, of 2001 that generated initially uh, a bill called the Authorization for the Use of Military Force. Now this was, this was the statute that was passed prior to the Patriot Act. This is the statute that was passed on September 18th, just seven days uh, after the events of 9-11. And this was a very short one-page statute that was passed uh, by the House and Senate giving authorization to the president, uh, which was what, really quite peculiar because it said, it said, uh, uh, it authorized him to use military force against those responsible for the recent attacks launched against the United States. And it said, whereas in light of the threat to the national security of the United States, and our foreign policy. It's really important to understand that this wasn't just a response to protecting the national security of the United States. It was an act that was authorizing the president to use military force to protect the, the foreign policy of the United States. And, uh, and it says, whereas uh, there is a continued threat of an extraordinary nature to the national security of the United States and to our foreign policy, uh, we hereby state that whereas the president, and this is a very peculiar statement, whereas the president has the authority under the Constitution to take action to deter and prevent acts of terrorism against the United States, we hereby resolve to uh, acknowledge that he has the authority to use military force to protect our national security and our foreign policy. Quite interesting because actually, if you look through the Constitution of the United States, you don't find any such authority whatsoever uh, given to the President of the United States. The Congress of the United States has the right to declare war. The Congress of the United States has the right to mobilize the military. It, it has appointed the President of the United States to be the Commander-in-Chief of the military once it's mobilized under an act of war. But nowhere in the Constitution whatsoever is there a place that authorizes the President of the United States to take action to deter and prevent acts uh, against the law? Uh, so that there, the, in this particular action, drafted by the Bush, the W. Bush administration, by David Addington in the Vice President's office under Cheney, specifically made this move to, to get Congress in the, in the midst of its kind of fervor in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 uh, events to do an extraordinary thing to, for the first time, authorize the President of the United States to take proactive measures to attempt to stop the violation of law. Uh, an entire transfiguration of the concept of law enforcement. Because the one, the one authority, the principal authority that you do see given to the President of the United States in, in Article 2, 
uh, uh, in Section 1, is to enforce the laws of the United States. But there, th that does not give him the authority to run around trying to prevent anybody from committing a crime. And yet, in this particular statute, they gave him that authority. And so, it was under the authorization for the use of the military, uh, and the use of military force, that began the process. Because what happened is that under the authorization, the blanket authorization of this, and we'll set aside again for discussion in the class, if you attend the class, the plan that was aggressively and actively underway by the W. Bush administration to launch a military attack into Afghanistan uh, in the middle of October. Uh, but, the, but the fact of the matter is, is that what happened is when he got this, they got this statute passed authorizing them to use the military force, what they did is they mobilized a major military operation to launch a military attack uh, into Afghanistan. Interestingly enough, one might be a bit puzzled over the fact that uh, the, the vast majority of everyone who participated allegedly in the attack on the, on the, uh, the Trade Center and the Pentagon were from Saudi Arabia. And yet, there was a decision made to attack Afghanistan. And it was a corollary of a, a more secret discussion going on to attack Iraq. But what, what happened is that under the auspices of this authority to use force, the W. Bush administration began to prepare an entire array of secret executive orders uh, that were moved into place. Uh, and he began to take steps such as renditioning people that he suspected of being involved in any way in supporting the, uh, the Al-Qaeda uh, and other groups, other associate groups. And they began to scoop them up around the world. And they would basically snatch them off the street, uh, shave their head, uh, give them an enema, uh, and bag them uh, in a burlap bag. And then they would abscond with them, and they would take them to secret military detention facilities where they would subject them to enhanced interrogation and torture uh, with the waterboarding and the locking them in, in tombs uh, where they couldn't breathe and, and holding them in there and, and the array of other actions you've heard about. And all of these things were being done by executive decree behind the authority of this particular statute, the authorization of the use of force. Uh, and then, then what they did is they passed the Patriot Act. Again, now the, the Patriot Act, the, this, this Patriot Act, this like telephone size, uh, telephone book size uh, uh, book was actually uh, introduced uh, in October. Uh, there, was a, there was an initial version of it that was uh, introduced on the floor, but it came in, to, in October 23rd, uh, uh, Jim Sensenbrenner introduced the, the House resolution. And they got this thing passed, and this went into great detail authorizing the president. It amended, actually, 37 different federal statutes, all in one swoop, uh, authorizing the, the alteration in the standards for wiretapping, electronic surveillance, uh, for arresting and detaining people, for breaking into people's homes and searching their homes without warrants, uh, an entire panoply of authoritarian measures that they, they got put into the Patriot Act, which was, was actually a, called, just for those of you who don't remember, the USA Patriot Act stands for Uniting and Strengthening America by providing, uh, uh, by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. Okay? Again, not to punish terrorism but to intercept it and, inter and stop it and to, to obstruct it, to stop it. Again, it was all prospective authority uh, that they had. And so that the wiretapping and electronic surveillance and the scooping up of people off the streets around the world was designed to prevent any future terrorist action. And you've heard the rather startling uh, interviews with, with Cheney, who, who has expressly stated that, well, naturally, you know, you don't sit around and wait for them to commit a crime like this, uh, because after all, it could be a mushroom cloud. Uh, they could get their hands on one of our previous nuclear devices, for example, that we're the ones that invented, uh, and use them against us. 
whereas it's our job to use those things. And, and so, that, so that what they did is they passed the Patriot Act uh, in, in October, uh, right away, uh, and it, it gave an entire array of other authorizations to prevent uh, terrorism. Now, a, a, a much less well-known event took place uh, in 2006, after W. in Cheney got, quote, re-elected, in 2004, again, primarily in Florida and Ohio, uh, with the voting machines that we're all aware about, they, they, they came back into, into office for their second term, and they proposed an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act of 2006. And what they did is they inserted into the National Defense Authorization Act, again, using it as a vehicle for sneaking these uh, provisions in, under the authority that they're going to be giving to the military to spend the military budget, they inserted a, an extraordinary section 1076 that you've never heard of. It was Public Law 109-364, that's 109th Congress, uh, Law number 364. And this was a statute that authorized the deployment of U.S. military troops into the states of the United States, here inside the country, in the event of any act of major terrorism. But it also, as it turned out, included uh, the authorization uh, to send U.S. military troops into any state to enforce local and state laws in the event of any incident or occasion in which the president determines that domestic violence has occurred to such an extent that the constituted authorities of the state are incapable of maintaining public order or to send in U.S. military troops to suppress in any state any insurrection or unlawful combination or any conspiracy designed to obstruct the due course of the enforcement of state law. Okay? Now, this is an extraordinary piece of legislation. This is setting aside the Posse Comitatus Act entirely that was passed back in, uh, in 1878 to stop the deployment of U.S. military forces into the states to establish martial law on the part of the federal government. And what they did is in a stroke, they set it aside, uh, authorizing the deployment under the guise again. Uh, in the uh, opening stick, the opening sentence of the, of the statute, and to authorize the sending of U.S. military troops in the event of any major nuclear uh, or any uh, terrorist attack. But actually, it was authorizing them as well to go in whenever the president determined that there was any threat of any unlawful combination or conspiracy that might obstruct the normal law enforcement within a state area. Uh, and when Congress discovered that they had done that, they immediately repealed it and pulled it back. And that is when the Department of Homeland Security and the Defense Department started taking administrative measures to start sneaking into the cities and states military equipment that the major military would want to have, such as Bearcats. Uh, and that they, they, began to, they began to offer unilateral uh, grants to police departments and the state BCIs, the State Bureau of Criminal Investigation, this massive military equipment, uh, in, in two different instances, actually involving tanks, sending in tanks for them to have. Uh, and the, so, so this is how this thing happened, <clears throat> this sneaking in these devices to be designed to allegedly prevent acts of terrorism or to combat acts of terrorism, where they would have to be mounted up like a major military uh, unit, uh, and armed accordingly, <clears throat> but in fact, you can see that the intention was not to restrict it to be used in, against acts of terrorism, but to be used against any type of uh, potential insurrection or unlawful combination or conspiracy that threatened to obstruct the normal enforcement of the laws. Okay, so this is the process that we were confronted with from 2006 all the way up to 2008 when Obama was elected. And so Obama, as you remember, 
was talking how, about how awful the Patriot Act was and how it had to be radically amended and it had to be changed and all of that. Uh, but when, in fact, he got into, into office, he discovered that having access to those kind of authorities, which he could blame on W, and Addington and the rest of the guys that passed it, all he had to do is not take any steps to change it because, as it turned out, even though the, the original uh, Patriot Act had a sunset clause on it that mandated that it expire in 2005. What happened is in July of 2005, uh, amendments started to be proposed to do away with the sunset clause, which they did. They eliminated the sunset clause that was supposed to come into operation in 2005, and they simply just woodenly extended the entire, the entire uh, Patriot Act uh, and the authorization for the use of force, and even though they didn't get away with sneaking this provision in permanently in 2006, they started sneaking it in through the through the back door by moving military equipment in and training police departments to function as military units, uh, not just to, to protect us against terrorism, but to protect against any type of civil disturbance or insurrection or any combination that might threaten. To, to challenge local law enforcement. And so what happened then is, is uh, we come to the, the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, the annual enactment of this National Defense Authorization Act. And what happened is in 2011, after Obama came to office, there was a proposal made by the right-wing Republicans in the House of Representatives to insert these sections 1021 and 1022. These are the big provisions. We talk about opposing the National Defense Authorization Act, but like 98% of the entire bill is just like every other National Defense Authorization Act, authorizing the funding of all these military bases, <coughs> really name them all, and the, the different weapons uh, systems and stuff that they want to get to finance. But they use it as a vehicle for sneaking in these special provisions under the color of anti-terrorism. And this section 1021 and 1022, they got snuck in to the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012. Specifically, uh, they are, are undertake this action explicitly asserting that the president basically already has all this authority. Under this, this general one-page one authorization for the use of military force. One single little page stating that in light of the fact that the president has the authority under the Constitution to take action to deter and prevent terrorism, this one little one paragraph that they passed, they say, oh well, in light of the fact that the president already has this authority, uh, let's try to clarify it. So what they do is they state in section 1021, they say that it says, affirming the authority of the president to use all necessary and appropriate force pursuant to the authorization for the use of military force, that is, the 2001 law passed, uh, including the authority for the armed forces of the United States to arrest and detain covered persons, as defined in subsection B, pending disposition under the law of war. So you ask yourself, where did that authority come from? That authority came from the fact that H.W. Bush was already doing it. He was doing it solely through a unilateral executive action. So what this was designed to do was to get Congress to consent to what it was that he was doing. Now this is the same thing that John Yu, that some of the people that were in David Addington's staff under Vice President Cheney were the ones writing all of these statutes. And John Yu, who's teaching up at Berkeley, to the shame of us all, is up there. He actually wrote a book called The National Security Constitution. And what he argued in the book was that if, in fact, the president undertakes a series of unilateral executive actions and Congress comes to know about it and doesn't do anything to stop him from doing it, it's effect like a common law consent on the part of Congress to that kind of activity. And that was how they were conducting themselves all the way through the, uh, the, uh, the W. Bush administration. Uh, because they were notifying certain people. They selected a certain little group of people from the House and Senate, the Intelligence Committee, and then they were putting them under absolute oath not to tell anybody in the world about it. 
And then they would tell them that they were doing these things. And then they were turning around and asserting that that gave them the authority to continue to do it because now Congress knew about it and they had effectively consented to it. So that they had basically deprived the Congress of the United States that has the sole exclusive constitutional authority to make war, that they had put them into a completely passive role of simply being notified about it in just a tiny handful of them, placing them under oath to not say a word about it to anybody, and using that as the rationale that now they've been authorized by Congress to do this. So what they decided to do is in 2012, they were going to now that they had Obama in office that most everybody trusted, and I used the past tense on that, uh, that everybody trusted him, so when we heard about these right-wingers in the, in the House of Representatives introducing this bill that specifically covered any person and authorized the uh, arrest and detention by United States military forces of any person, which includes Americans, in arresting any person who plans, authorized, or committed, or aided in the terrorist attacks of September 11th of 2001. Okay? People go, no, nah, okay or who harbored those responsible for such attacks, or any person who substantially supported Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, eh, okay, or associated forces uh, uh, that are engaged in hostilities against the United States, or any of its coalition partners, uh, including any person who has directly supported any of those hostilities and given any substantial assistance to any of those organizations. Now, that's, that's the operative language that went in under section uh, uh, 1021. That's the one where everybody started saying, wait a second, does this cover Americans? It says any person and any place where they want to swoop them up and take them into custody. Doesn't require any finding of probable cause by any judicial branch, in fact, doesn't allow them to have any judicial hearings, doesn't allow them the right of habeas corpus. So it suspends the right of habeas corpus, which is one of the most fundamental rights that are included in the Constitution for every citizen in the country. Nobody can be detained or arrested by any executive branch official uh, unless they're brought before an independent judicial magistrate and the executive branch is compelled to demonstrate what the information is that would cause any reasonable person to believe that that person had already committed a specific crime. Now, you can see why they don't want that to happen. Because they don't believe they have to prove that they've committed any crime. They just want to sustain, uh, detain them and arrest them if they suspect they might be thinking of doing such a crime or if they gave any substantial support of any kind to any person who was thinking of committing such a crime. So you can see how attenuated this kind of authority is getting now uh, to go after people like this. Hedges, Hedges, Hedges in the city. That's right, that's what I was getting right to now. And, and so, thank you, thank you. So, so, so what happened is a number of, a number of citizens, Chris Hedges, uh, Dan Ellsberg, uh, in, in a number of others, uh, all gathered together, uh, 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 people that, that were aggressive critics of American, American foreign policy under H.W. Bush and W. Bush, and continuing now under Obama. Uh, what they did is they gathered together and they filed a federal lawsuit in New York City, in the federal court, and said, look, this language here uh, is so overbroad and vague you know, what does it mean, anybody who has provided any su substantial support for any associated organization of any person who has given any uh, support for, uh, for any of these groups, you know, does that include us, who, uh, for example, Chris Hedges, who was a journalist, he said, I've interviewed any number of people from the Taliban. And perhaps if I wrote an article that demonstrated or displayed any type of sympathy whatsoever, for any of their positions, does that mean I could be swept off off the street with no probable cause and incarcerated with no right to trial, no right to an attorney, could be put in front of a military tribunal and, and, uh, and, and permanently incarcerated in a military detention facility, uh, you know, with no notice to any of my relatives, with no charges made against me, no right to confront my, my uh, accusers. Uh, is, is that what that means? So they come before the federal court and they were seeking a federal declaratory judgment 
to declare the statute unconstitutional to the extent to which it might be applied against them. And so, so the, the judge, the federal district court judge, an appointee of, uh, of Obama, said to the United States Attorney from the Southern District of New York, okay, listen, uh, these people are all here asserting that they have a reasonable fear of being swept up in, under this statute. Uh, and, uh, and I would have to rule, if they were subjected to this kind of uh, treatment, I'd have to rule as to whether or not this statute is unconstitutional because it violates their First Amendment rights of freedom of speech, freedom to criticize, freedom to associate, to communicate with any of the people that you might have put on one of your lists. Uh, and the United States Attorney, she said, that all you have to do to get rid of this lawsuit is just tell us officially that these people wouldn't be covered. And he said, I'm afraid I can't do that. I cannot say that they would not be covered. Uh, and, and they were very specific about the kinds of actions that they were talking about, interviewing them, writing articles, publicly criticizing the administration, etc. And he explicitly said that he was not able to say that wouldn't be covered under this statute, and that they couldn't be swept off the street and permanently incarcerated. And so she declared it to be unconstitutional. Unconstitutionally vague, unconstitutionally overbroad, and a direct violation of the First Amendment if it was going to be applied against them. At which point, they immediately appealed to the Circuit Court of Appeals, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, that reversed her and declared that there was no standing on the part of these people, despite the fact that the U.S. Attorney expressly acknowledged that he was insisting that they be perceived as being subject to this application of the statute. And they said, look, uh, we're not going to rule on the, uh, the constitutionality of it. They just don't have any standing to object to it. And Feinstein actually went so far as to say, look it, uh, because of some language that's in section 1022, which I, I only told you about 1021, the, the authorization to sweep up people and incarcerate them, there's a section 1022 which says, oh, by the way, when you arrest anybody under section 1021, you have to house them in a military detention facility, where, of course, they can be subjected to enhanced interrogation. And so they had a mandatory provision in there that when you arrest anybody under Section 1021, you have to incarcerate them in a military detention facility or they can be gotten at by the interrogators. And then the pressure got put on to say, well, wait a second, you can't do that. You have to give some authorization to have Americans excluded from that. And so they put in a provision in there saying that the mandate to put them into a military detention facility didn't necessarily apply to Americans which means that they could put them into the military detention facilities, but if the president ordered them not to be kept in that facility, he had the authority to let them be in a civilian facility. But it doesn't mean that Americans were not subject to being arrested under Section 1021. And so, so what happened is because of the confusion that was being caused, because a lot of the people around the country were going, oh, look at this language in Section 1022. It says very clearly, that, uh, that uh, this, this authority to detain a person in military custody does not extend to citizens of the United States. And they were trying to confuse everybody about this, just like they do with the, the popular referenda in our, in our state here. And they were trying to confuse them. So, so, uh, so uh, Senator Feinstein put in a proposed amendment expressly excluding American citizens from being arrested under this provision. And it was rejected on the grounds that Americans should be subject to this. And so that we know perfectly well that not only that it covers Americans, but that both Boxer and Feinstein knew that it covered Americans, and they still voted for it. Okay? And so the, the, the Senate has said, everybody kept saying then is, don't worry, Obama will veto this. Okay? But that was the reason they put it inside the National Defense Authorization Act. Because they put it in there at the last hour in December. And unless, you, unless the president signs it into law, then there's no money, there's no financing available for the whole military. And that was the tactic that they used. And so Obama, at 11.55 p.m. on New Year's Eve of 2011, signs the law into, into law. Okay, and, it was, and, and what happened is immediately people started freaking out around the country and talking about doing something about it. But very importantly, it turns out that the Santa Cruz City Council, in April of 2012, four months later, 
was the very first city council in the entire country to pass a resolution against it. And they wanted to call for its repeal, and they were affirming the principle of providing to all persons within our jurisdiction of the city of Santa Cruz all of the constitutionally recognized due process rights and other fundamental rights guaranteed to them by our state and federal constitutions. So they said that. They were the very first ones on board actually saying that. Then a number of other uh, city councils around the country, Albany, New York, in October 2012, Oxford, Massachusetts, uh, on October 9th of 2012, on the 23rd of October, Webster, Massachusetts, uh, in a number of 125 cities have been talking about passing resolutions, but they're afraid to say so because they're afraid they look like they're soft on terrorism. Okay? But what happened, very importantly, and this is one of the things that, that even we didn't realize, but it, it turns out that the state assembly here in California on February 13th of 2013, this is basically a year after the, the statute has been put into to authority, the California State Assembly passed a bill, uh, House Assembly Bill 351, by a vote of 71 to 1, that actually declared it to be a criminal offense for any federal official to attempt to come into the state of California and enforce either Section 1021 or 1022, and made it a criminal offense for any official or law enforcement officer of the state of California to participate in any manner whatsoever in attempting to enforce either of these provisions. Now what happened is the state, after the state assembly passed that, that's our House of Representatives, the state senate took up the bill and they, for some bizarre reason, which we still need through our research subcommittee to figure out here, that they wanted to get a totally unanimous vote of the senate uh, agreeing to oppose the bill. So what they did is they, they watered it down and watered it down until they got a 37 to 0 vote in the Senate. But they only ended up stating that it shall be the policy of the estate to refuse to provide material support for or participate in any way in the implementation of either of these statutes. And no local law enforcement agency or local municipal government or the employee of that agency or government acting in his or her official capacity shall use state funds or funds allocated by the state or local entities to participate in the enforcement of this statute. Okay? So now, now that's meaningful. That's meaningful. It's prohibiting the officials from participating in it in any way. But, in fact, it's removed the criminal sanctions against the state officials, and it's removed the criminal sanctions against the, uh, against the federal officials coming in. And so the bottom line is that there's no teeth in it. Uh, even though it does provide that anybody who receives a notice that there's going to be any such activity are required to notify the Attorney General of the state. Okay? Now, so what we're, what we're proposing is that in light of the fact that our city council took the first steps to oppose it officially, in light of the fact that our state assembly has voted 71 to 1 to make it a criminal offense, for any federal official to come in to try to enforce it, and a criminal offense for any state official or law enforcement officer to participate within, what we want to do is we've proposed a resolution, which you can get from our office, uh, a resolution which in fact provides the following, that if any, it shall be unlawful for any officer, law enforcement officer, or any official uh, or any employee of the, of the city of Santa Cruz uh, to participate in any way whatsoever. And in fact, it will be a, a condition of their continued future employment. That if they receive any such notice, they have to immediately contact the, every single member of the city council and notify her or him uh, that they've received information that indicates that there's going to be some attempt to enforce this inside our city. And that the city council, pursuant to the resolution, would be required to immediately convene and to take every step necessary to identify who the potential target of such a procedure is, and that they are to provide to that person a full hearing with our judicial officials 
to have them brought before the judicial officials and to contact the federal authorities and the state authorities and to say, if you have any evidence that this person has committed any crime, that you are compelled at this time to come before a, a, a magistrate, and this person will be provided every single one of the due process rights here in our county and here in our city, because this is a constitutional protection zone. And in fact, if you have any case to make, you get here and you make it. Uh, or else that person is going to be declared to be not subject to your authority. And the, 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 the resolution would then require that our city officials contact Governor Jerry Brown and insist that this person be given the protection of the governor of the state uh, and our attorney general to protect that person against any enforcement of this statute. Very simple, quite lawyer-like, but in fact very specific provisions to put teeth and enforcement in the very policy that's already been announced by our state legislature. And in fact, that it's even less onerous than the criminal sanctions that the state assembly has voted 71 to 1 to impose upon them. So we're their best friends. You know, we're, we're here trying to help out the police officers and stuff to keep them from being put in prison for this. We're, try, we're trying to, it's just a condition of their future employment with us, that they have to no, notify and not participate in any way in enforcing 101, uh, 121 or 122, uh, uh, 102, 1022. But in fact, they in fact have to contact the city council. So we're putting all the burden on the city council to take the affirmative steps which we've explicated to provide judicial protection for our people. And then we're going to ask if, if we can get it through the, when we get it through the, uh, the city council, to then move to the board of supervisors to have it done on a county-wide level. And then what we want to do is move through the other counties, to move through the other counties, to get the other counties in the, in the state to do this, one after another, the cities and counties, and then have our entire state move back up to the level that was indicated by the state assembly to make it a criminal offense in the state to try to enforce that, to become the first state in the nation that basically absolutely refuses to participate and, in fact, makes it a criminal offense to try to come in here to enforce it. Okay? And then we can move to the other states uh, one by one. Okay? So that's the task before us. Uh, that, uh, that was my brief legal uh, review. Uh, <laughs> Our mission is to come together in Santa Cruz County in a broad coalition to defend and protect our United States Constitution and our rights under it to free speech, free assembly, freedom of religion, right to an attorney, and trial by peers, and all other constitutional rights. To protect this sacred ground, this sacred trust, this grand experiment in the history of humanity for us and for our children and grandchildren. And to work in a spirit of honesty, respect for others, inclusiveness, and focus on the goal. To offer our materials to other cities and counties and encourage them to begin this mission in their area. That's what I'm proposing as a mission statement. Uh, stra strategy, what would be our strategy? Okay, what's our, what's our goal? Persuade the City Council and the Board of Supervisors of Santa Cruz County to pass an ordinance making our county a constitutional protection zone. Provide all of our materials and documents to other cities and counties in California to launch their own local efforts and reach out nat nationally to do the same. Tactics, so say, so tactically, what do we do to actually implement this? Build a broad coalition, generate thousands of petition signatures, win the support of citizens, initiate a large event, I have one in mind. You guys may have other ones in mind. Possibly initiate a canvassing effort. Research, educate, organize, and communicate. Multiply our numbers methodically. Educate and recruit key organizations and constituencies in our area, as well as the general public. Ask all groups to officially join our coalition. Um, ask all people to sign our petition. The petition is really our growing individual base. The coalition is our growing organizational base. And we'll need all of that when we go to the council or to the board of supervisors. Um, organize the support and help of attorneys and other leaders, this is a legal issue, um, to, <clears throat> who have influence on the elected leaders. Organize people to be ready to attend the city council meeting and the board of supervisors meeting in mass with cameras, focus on our unity around this goal and set aside our differences. Build a community around this goal. This is a very important point that we have to set aside our differences to do this.
Because we want as many people in our tent. Is that how you say it? As, as possible in our basket. We, we want as many people with us as will join with us. And that we may not agree on other things. We may have other issues where we don't agree, but it's important that we focus on this together. Because this is for all of us. Uh, this, these rights are for everyone. So um, then we get to distribute our ordinance and our materials to other cities. Okay, logistics. Now obviously with logistics, logistics, without logistics, everything falls apart. It's so important. It's the detail work, it's the administrative work, it's the database systems, it's the printing and putting together agendas, all this. But basically I wanted to add something else here for, because this is logistics for all of us. Pay attention to the details and do what we say we will do. Do not let our teammates down. Stay connected and organized and coordinate with the, de the details. Maintain communication, provide materials, and produce materials for educational efforts and events. Show up at meetings. It isn't only the goal and the tactics, it's how we implement. Be kind, be focused, be committed, be honest, be sincere, stay on course, and do not get distracted. Learn the educational material well enough to be able to persuade others and become a speaker if you can. I don't know if that really is what you put under logistics, but I just wanted to put it there. Because I think it's something we can all reflect on. My first work is on the UCSC and three of campuses, and we were going to do that. We have a plan. First, we're going to identify professors and um, try to contact them and then attend their lectures and then do a brief presentation before their lecture begins. They typically allow this. And there we will pass around the petition as well as give it a brief summary about our task. Second, um, we want to set up booths on both campuses about once a week where we can pass out literature and educate anyone walking by and also get petitions signed. Um, third is we're going to fly around both campuses with educational, um, it'll just like have information on the MBA and how you can help and sign the petition. Um, fourth thing, uh, we're going to contact student organizations on campus, um, tell them about our cause, ask them to pass their petition around the organization. And the fifth thing is we're going to try to arrange speaking events on both campuses so that students can come together and have discussions about this. Basically, we are committed to providing um, information and facts to the other committees so that you can base your strategy as to go how to go about uh, getting CPZ past the city and the county level. Um, we have a lot of uh, specific plans that we're really excited about. We're going to pull uh, documents from the county and the city. We're going to research political demographics here in uh, uh, Santa Cruz in both the city and the county. We're going to pull election results. We're going to research the biographies of the seven council members and the five members of the board of supervisors. We're going to look at election documents that uh, show and describe how, um, who contributed to their campaigns. Um, we are basically going to comprehensively and thoroughly an analyze the political landscape uh, in Santa Cruz. <laughs>
Also, social media. I mean, a question about social media and tweeting. So, how do you how to organize that? There's a lot of interest in that. And uh, a number of people don't have much time, but are going to put in all the time they can. And uh, a couple of us have significant time and want to use it. So, good start. Okay. Art and music. Art and music? So we just kind of combined art, music, and education, and we went around and introduced each other and got a landscape of um, what, our, what our skills are, and um, some ideas that popped up were maybe having a table at the farmer's market and having some music involved so we can draw people in. Also having booths at different festivals. Um, one of those festivals is the New Living Expo, which Danny, I believe, is going to be a part of. There's also the Rejuvenation Festival here in Santa Cruz, Earth Day, things like that, where we can incorporate music into um, our message. Um, also, we are going to send out the logo and the brand for CPC um, just first within the education and the art and music group so that we can use those logos in order to put them on our own social media. Um, and we're going to try and get together before the next large group gets together so that we can actually come up with some real good concrete ideas. Look forward. Um, admin and tech? Oh, okay. Uh, legal? We, we've got a lot of stuff, obviously, we have to look at uh, to make certain that the, the questions, for example, of what response the federal government might have to the enactment of an ordinance like this that have to do with them asserting that they have uh, the, the exclusive authority to pass resolutions on terrorism, et cetera, and that the states can't contradict them or the cities can't uh, countervail them. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we have to, to work on in that regard. Plus, there's also a, that a lot of the people that are involved in elections, as you know, around the country are lawyers. And so what we were talking about is, is having uh, an understanding of, of conducting this almost like a a, uh, a political campaign to to organize a whole whole uh, uh, initiative with regard to the individual members of the city council and to the to the uh, uh, county board of commissioners, so that they're thinking in terms of their next election, very concretely. You know, what what impact is this going to have on their next election? Not only positively but negatively if they don't if they don't support it, so that we can say like. We're very familiar with, with how to organize you know, someone else to take your place who happens to agree with this thing. Uh, so that, that, that's a, that's a uh, kind of a lawyer-like thing to do. <laughs> well, we had a small committee. But it's going to be powerful, and we know everybody is going to be on this committee, right? And then, because we're all going to be fundraising. Okay, so some of the ideas that we had for fundraising initially were um, to have a large event uh, before we go forward um, and approach the council. So if we're going to do that in June, to have a large event in like May with somebody who is really, really popular who would help us out as a musician, like somebody famous. So that was one of the first ideas. And then we kind of piggybacked that to, um, we were just talking about ways we might fundraise, like barbecues and things. We started thinking about the weather and the time of year, and we were like, well, maybe we could do something once a month, have it centered around something like, for example, Valentine's Day, or in, and then in March, like spring coming up, or St. Patty's Day. So, for example, for February, maybe um, doing some outreach on the idea of or we all really love our rights, and we really do love our Constitution, and finding a great musical pair like Tuck and Patty that's coming into town and asking them if they would pitch it from their, you know. So piggyback with audiences, and Nora said that she knows somebody at the Rio, and so we're going to think about actually at the beginning just kind of 
doing it this way, picking it back in it with people that are already out there in the world, like musicians and uh, venues like the Rio, and to get this thing maybe focusing on at least one, one fundraiser a month. And then another idea that we were talking about, but we're not thinking we would go forward with right this moment, would be the idea of a more systematic canvas or outreach effort, where the idea of the canvas is you try to literally canvas, like the, you know, the white canvases people paint on, the idea that you're, you're hitting every single door in the community, and, and therefore even finding doors. Because in San Diego, uh, Santa Cruz here, there's like ADUs, and, Granny apartments and all these things, but that that type of effort might be better utilized, like Danny's saying, once we have see that we have a need, because it could be quite um, intensive in terms of getting enough people to do the canvas. But meanwhile, we came back to the idea that, meanwhile, we could um, maybe set up um, house parties and things in neighborhoods, maybe not a canvas, but definitely working to kind of reach all the different neighborhoods and with things like that that are a little less systematic but still organized and, you know, do you see what I'm saying? It is systematic but not a canvas. So those were some of the ideas that we came up with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.